question, and we're just going to go about 10, 15 minutes. So atoms, which we've already talked about, are the smallest form of matter. Everybody, I want you to hold up your Lego lab. Hold up your Lego lab. That I just handed back. That means you didn't turn one in. Good. Now, go ahead and put it down. In that Lego lab, if you recall, I gave you a container. And what was in that container? A Lego. How many Legos was in that container? One. Just one. Right? Can you do anything with that one Lego? Not really. Imagine, for Christmas, you wake up, there's a huge box, and you open it up, and all that's in there is one Lego. What are you going to do with that one Lego besides throw it at your parents for getting you that one Lego? Right? You can't do anything with it. But what if you open up that box, and there's about 500 Legos in it? Well, now you can do a whole bunch of stuff. One day you can make a car. You can take them apart. The next day you can make a house. You can take them apart. The next day you can make a plane. You take them apart. Because by combining those Legos together in different orders and in different amounts, you can create brand new things. And that's how everything around you is made. Like the atom is a Lego. It's the Lego of life. And by combining it in different ways and different fashions, you get everything that surrounds you on a daily basis. If you think of atoms like Legos, which is why we did the Lego Lab, then it makes an incredible amount of sense about how, with just 119 elements that we know of, it makes an incredible, uh, we understand how just those number of atoms can make everything that surrounds us. It makes much more sense when we think of it in that way. A compound is made up of two or more atoms that are bonded together. So water is a compound because it is H2O. We have hydrogen, we have oxygen. It creates something brand new. A compound is a com a completely pure substance made up of two or more elements, such as chlorine and sodium. But the big idea about this is that the new substance formed acts or looks nothing like what you use to make it. Okay? Let me give you an example. Let's say that you have a toy car, and a turtle. Two totally weird different things. And you were able to smash them together and make something new. And now you have a unicorn. It looks nothing like the turtle. It looks nothing like the car. It acts nothing like either of them. But it's something brand new. Now, that's a weird analogy, but sometimes we need to force you with weird analogies so you get the idea. Because look at sodium and chlorine. Remember, sodium and chlorine come together to create something we use on a daily basis known as salt. Salt on your pretzels. Salt on your mashed potatoes. Table salt. That's all it is. But it comes from sodium, which is a soft, shiny metal. It's so soft, you can cut it with a butter knife. You can mold it like Play-Doh, but it's a metal. But when you throw it in water, it gets so excited that it lights on fire and blows up. It's an explosive metal. Just imagine if your quarters were made out of sodium. Every time you made a wish in the wishing well, the well would blow up. Oh, okay? awesome. More people would probably make wishes if that happened, I guess. And chlorine, it's a dense, foggy, green gas that if you breathe it in, you die. But it just so happens when the deadly gas meets the explosive metal, it creates a tasty treat. It acts nothing like the sodium. It acts nothing like the chlorine. It looks nothing like either of them, but it's made of them. So understand. The individual parts that make the compound no longer look anything like the compound. Completely different. 
completely different. Here's a quick Tim and Moby for you to take a look at. And I'm going to hold off on mixtures and solutions because we're going to be learning about those in Unit 5. Okay? But understand, once again, compounds form something completely new that doesn't resemble anything like what they originally started with. So two or more different pure substances combined together form a compound. Molecules are the smallest portion of that compound. So water is tons of H2O molecules. That's the compound. But the individual H2O molecule, we call that the molecule. And these are some molecules that you've probably heard of. Carbon dioxide. It's CO2. Okay, that's what you breathe out. Okay, that's what you expel when you're breathing. H2O. That's what you drink. And then methane. Where do you think that comes from? Well, every time you drive past Fresno State, you smell what that comes from. Right? It comes from the cows. Methane gas, okay? To describe this, we use a chemical formula. Now, that sounds completely scientific. It's not, wow, I'm never going to use a chemical formula. That sounds crazy. But it, all it means is a short way of explaining what you got, right? And we did that in our Lego lab. Remember, after I gave you the one Lego... I gave you a box filled with tons of Legos. And what did I ask you to do? Make something. I said, make me a compound. That just means play with the Legos and make me something. Some of you made a house. Some of you made an airplane. And what I wanted you to do was come up with a way in your own, in your mind, of how you would explain to somebody over the phone of what you made and what you used to make it. Who came up with a good idea? What did you do? When you made something, what was the shorthand way that you would explain what you used? Okay. Well, if you look, we had our periodic Lego elements that we created. And Mia used the BQ three times. So she put BQ three. Right? And if she used the L four times, she'd put L four. Notice she's telling me what we used using the, the letter symbol and the three telling me how many times she used it. It's just a short way of explaining what you got. That's all a chemical formula is. It tells me in a short, quick way what elements and how many have I used. Like CO2. Instantly I know that I have one C and two O's, carbon dioxide. I know what I've used. So if I, had, if I needed to build this using Legos, I could. I grab one Lego listed as C and two Legos listed as two, as O. In water scale, it's two hydrogen particles for every one oxygen particle. No extra. 
structures are allowed. All molecules in a compound are the same. Okay, so carbon dioxide, one parts hydrogen, two parts oxygen. Okay, so let, let's look at silver nitrate. That's what this is called. Okay, now please recall that not every element has a single letter designation. Like AG, that is silver, right? That's for silver. So that's one element, AG. If you see a lowercase, it belongs to the previous uppercase. So then we have nitrogen and then we have oxygen. So who can tell me how many silver, mole silver atoms we used here? How many silver? One, right? But there's no one there. How come we said one? Yeah, good. It's implied, right? If I didn't use silver, why would I put it there, right? So if I don't see a number, it's implied that it's one. How many nitrogens are here? One. How many oxygens? Three. So you can build silver nitrate if you can grab one silver, one nitrogen, and three oxygens. You can build silver nitrate. So you're right. One silver, one nitrogen, and three oxygen. Okay, now, let me ask you this. How many different elements did I use? Just how many different elements did I use? Three. I used silver, nitrogen, and oxygen. So if I ask you how many elements I used, you only count the uppercase letters because that's how many I've used. I used three different elements. But what if I ask you how many total atoms I used? What would you do? Sarah? Five, because I use three atoms of oxygen, one atom of nitrogen, and one atom of silver. That is the different ways I can ask questions on the test. I can give you a chemical formula, which is this. That's all a chemical formula is. That's it. And I can say, how many elements did I use? And you can answer it using the letters. How many atoms did I use? You can answer that using the, these are called subscripts, and I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, or what is the different amount? One silver, one nitrogen, one oxygen. Now, these are subscripts. It tells me how many of that element I used. It's called subscript, the same reason why a submarine is called a submarine. The word sub means below. Okay, so a submarine means below water because marine means water submarine below water subscript means below the writing so this is your writing the letters and it's below the letter so subscript okay that tells you how many of that letter you used so for the chemical formula sucrose i know i used 12 carbons 22 hydrogens and 11 oxygen sucrose is just sugar that's all sucrose is sugar Okay, so same, please don't get the ionic charge confused with the subscript. This tells you how many electrons I want to uh, give away. This tells you how many bromines I used. Okay, so don't get the ionic charge confused with the subscript. Okay, and then you have your atomic structure. This is the whole reason we create bonds. Okay, so we create bonds by the easiest leaving electrons. And before we end, we're going to end in like two minutes. I want you to think for a second, which is the easiest electrons to leave? Which electrons do you think would be easiest to leave on the outside? Why on the outside? Why not on the inside? Yeah, because the inside is in the, is in the prime seat. About 10 years ago, Metallica came to the uh, Save Mart Center. Okay? And it was pretty neat because they had a center stage. Normally, concerts have a stage in the back area of the arena, and all those seats can't be used, right, because they're blocked off with their curtains and stuff, and then the rest of the arena is used. But Metallica was such a big band, their stakes pretty much still are, that they want to use the entire arena. So what they did is they put a center stage, a round stage, and the stage rotated. So everybody had a perfect seat. But the hardest 
area to get to was where? Where do you think the hardest area to get to? The front, right around the stage. You had to get there hours in advance, and you got there right next to the stage. And when you got there, were you ever leaving? Nope. No. Even if you wanted to, if you really had to go to the bathroom really, really bad, you couldn't leave because you knew you'd never get that spot again. Plus, pushing your way out wouldn't work. So the people next to the stage are the most motivated to stay there. That's the way those electrons work. The ones a little bit farther away from the stage, they can pretty much kind of really squeeze their way out and come back, but it's still going to be pretty difficult. The ones all the way on the outside, they can be like, uh, I'm going to go get a hot dog and come back. I'm going to go to the bathroom and then come back and not have to worry about it. That's the way the electrons work. The easiest ones to leave are the outside electrons. What's another word we use for outside when we talk about this? Not shell. Valence. Valence means outside. Remember, the word surveillance, when we're talking about police doing surveillance, that means to watch. Survey, sur means to watch. And valence means outside. So surveillance means to watch from the outside. So when we talk about outside electrons, we use the word valence which is going to help us out when we start talking about the bonds called covalent bonds, meaning sharing the outside electron. Okay? So on Friday, we will be finalizing our Unit 3. So on Friday, we will be covering these topics. Why do ionic bonds uh, happen? And why do covalent bonds happen? Those are what we're going to be covering. We're also going to be covering crystals, which we made before break. We're going to talk about them a little bit. And finally, we're going to talk about metals and a few of their properties. And then we will be done for this unit. Raise your hand when you, if you know when our test is. When is our test? January 15th, which just so happens to be how many days from today? Seven days, one week. One week from today, you'll be taking your unit three exam. So what is due on that day as well? The packet. The packet. Does the packet have to be signed? Yes. Does every page have to be complete? Yes. Have you, you've had more than six weeks to work on it, correct? Yes. So it should be done. It should be complete. It should be ready. It should be ready to turn in. Your final homework pages, 20, 21, and 22, will be due on Friday. So I'm going to give you the last 20 minutes of class to work with a partner. Ask me questions to get those final three pages done and completed. There's one page in your packet that everybody seems to miss, and it's the page right after the stamp sheet that looks like this. It's the sheet with the polar bears on it. Where is it? Right here. Structure of matter. Everybody seems not to want to fill this part out. Okay? Some of you are like, well, I don't need the point, so I'm not going to do it. Well, fine. For those people, you're now going to start getting detention if you don't do this page. It's simple. You read the standard, and you think back through the unit, what did we do in class to help me learn that standard? Was it a lab? Was it a lecture? Was it a project? And just write down what we did in class to help you learn that standard. That's all you're doing on this page. You guys got it? Okay, so you have about 20 minutes to work on pages 20, 21, and 22. Now, remember, you can always go on the website and review this session by clicking on PowerPoint's recorded session. You can work with a partner. <laughs>